Hi guys, Nick here from Conservation Chris and welcome to the podcast. Now, have you ever met someone and thought to yourself, how has this person managed to do so much in such a short space of time? Well, I felt like that with today's guest, Josh Powell. Now, Joshua, he's a conservation biologist and a presenter for WWF Voices campaign on global biodiversity, covering conservation issues from the high Arctic right down to the Antarctic. And in 2017, as National Geographic Explorer, Josh co-founded Rangers Without Borders, which is a conservation research program working with wildlife rangers across Central Asia and Eastern Europe. And he's currently completing a PhD at ZSL um, on a muir tiger conservation in Northeastern Asia. And finally, as an advisor for the Queen's Commonwealth Trust on Environment and Social Policy, Josh was recently named one of the Explorers Club 50, which is 50 people changing the world. He's a busy guy. <laughs> in this episode, we talk about what drives him in his career, how he's managed to open so many doors and opportunities, and he shares some fantastic advice for what you can do to follow in his impressive footsteps. It's an inspiring and really wide ranging chat. So let's just dive straight in. Enjoy. So welcome to the podcast, Josh. It's great to have you on. Thanks for joining. Thanks for connecting as well. Um, so you are, well, you're, you're a man with so many different strings to your bow. So you're a conservation biologist. You're doing a PhD right now um, on a Muir um, Tigers. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, no, that's correct. Yeah, no, we're doing yeah. that at, at ZSL at the moment. So does help. Great. Um, you've also, you're a National Geographic Explorer. You're a voice of the WWF Voices campaign. Um, you've set up and helped to establish a Rangers Without Borders. Um, and you're involved in that. There's loads going on right now. Um, let, let's start at the top. Let's start. So you're a conservation biologist. That's how you describe yourself. What does that mean? How do you, how do you, how do you describe to your grandparents what a conservation biologist is? Well, uh, it, first of all, thank you for, for having me. And, um, I guess as a, a conservation biologist, I'm, I'm really interested in conservation science, like that intersection between, um, the study of ecology and essentially its practical application, um, which often means that you're looking to use techniques both from the natural sciences and the social sciences. Conservation is all about working with people. Um, but I'm also really interested in applied conservation. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what makes conservation biology stand out um, from other similar fields and maybe what distinguishes it uh, from, say, pure zoology or ecology. So you're not just trying to answer interesting questions, you're trying to answer interesting questions that also have a, a direct application in the field, something which will help to conserve a species, a site, a, an ecosystem, that sort of thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's a, a brilliant way of putting it. Um, and that's uh, both in my PhD uh, and in my wider work. I, I think those are, are common themes. Right. OK, well, let, let, let's talk about your PhD then. So you're at um, ZSL, which is the Zoological Society of London for those people that are listening or watching. Um, and what is what exactly is your, your study topic? Like, what are, you, what are you trying to answer? So I, I'm interested in transboundary conservation. Um, mm. It's an area where a lot of conservation is, is done on a national level. Um, and this is something that we found with Range Without Borders as well. And I'm interested in how uh, conservation can be effectively conducted between countries and across borders. And there's a couple of reasons why that's the case. Borders are particularly interesting for wildlife populations. They're often less disturbed than uh, other locations in the country. So they might support particularly important wildlife populations. Um, and they also perform all sorts of other uh, functions, obviously, politically and socially. So what I'm interested in is specifically for the armored tiger, um, a species which is spread across a couple of different countries. Um, so obviously the, the tiger, Panthera tigris, um, uh, across Asia and then this specific population up in Northeast Asia, mainly in Russia, but a small population beginning to return to China, an unknown population as to whether one occurs in North Korea or not. Um, so what I'm interested in is, is how can you uh, essentially effectively conserve this population across these quite complicated geopolitical boundaries. Mm. And what do we know about the Emir tiger? I mean, is it an endangered species? How many individuals do we think there might be in the wild? What's its conservation outlook at the moment? So there was a, a recent reclassification and um, it's important to note that, um, for example, when I'm based at, at ZSL or UCL in the UK, um, mm -hmm. the population is actually referred to slightly differently than when I'm 
uh, based in South Korea at Seoul National University, mm -hmm. um, where that reclassification hasn't necessarily fully um, been incorporated. Uh, so is this the difference the between a species and a subspecies? Yeah, What's absolutely. So in, in this case, it's whether it's a subspecies or it's just a different population. Yep. Um, and uh, essentially, it's now believed that uh, the Armour tiger is, is part of Panthera tigris tigris, uh, essentially the, the mainland Asian tiger. Mm -hmm. um, that is that it's uh, not that dissimilar um, from tigers that you see in India, mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously for uh, any of these kind of like highly uh, endangered uh, species worldwide, that's of, of tremendous political importance locally as well. Um, so there's in incredible um, will uh, locally, particularly in Russia, to conserve um, these individual populations. Um, the good news is, uh, is that there has been this attention, this focus over the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, the trend is possibly encouraging. Uh, and certainly this idea of, of, the, of the Arnold Tiger returning into China, that's something that we haven't seen um, for quite a long time. Um, but we're now beginning to get increasingly good camera trap data um, to show that tigers really have returned. Now, the population in China is still incredibly small mm -hmm. um, compared to the 500 or so individuals that are on the Russian side of the border. Um, but it's certainly encouraging. So you're sort of indicating that it's it's been through a period of decline. It's now expanding again. This subspecies or species. Um, yeah, what what historically what was the population like? Do we think and and what's its trajectory been like? You know, if it's expanding now, did it hit hit bottom? Were there a few individuals left? You know, what, what paint that sort of picture for us, please. Yeah. So um, over, over the past twenty years, both the the Arnold tiger and the Arnold leopard. Uh -huh. uh, have, have gone through um, incredible population squeezes, yeah. uh, really. Um, but with the recent reclassification, it, it changes the way that we think about the population overall. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, that suggests that uh, the tiger range was, was potentially originally um, throughout large swathes of Asia. Um, I mean, originally, uh, there was a tiger population uh, out as far as Central Asia. Um, which is really kind of these vast distances. Um, but over time, uh, the habitat of the tiger uh, was gradually reduced in these areas. And, and all too often, the story was of a direct conflict with, with human populations and obviously also uh, the use of, of tiger parts um, in traditional medicine uh, across much of its, ra its range. Right. Okay. So what are you trying to answer then? What's your PhD focus? What's, what's, the, what's going to be the application that comes out of this? So uh, we're interested in a couple of things. First uh -huh. of all, um, there are some gaps, interestingly, um, which is, is quite remarkable for such a, a well-studied animal. Like, there are gaps in our understanding about uh, where armor tigers exist mm -hmm. uh, historically and today. Mm -hmm. um, and we're hoping to, to fill in some of those gaps. Um, I've only just started, um, but we're beginning to make a little bit of progress on that. So that's encouraging. And it must be but hard then, starting in COVID as well, because you're not, oh, well, it's, it's a yeah. lot of destinies right now, I'm thinking, a lot of, you know. Yeah, yeah no, it's been very difficult. Um, and I'm heading out, uh, hopefully to Korea, um, as we were discussing at the end of the month. And um, that'll be a really good opportunity, um, hopefully to get out in the field. Um, but we're then also interested in looking at a range of different conservation in, interventions that, that could be put in place mm -hmm. um, with uh, small and in, endangered species. But with large carnivores in particular, that's always going to run into difficulty uh, with human communities because mm -hmm. these are inhabited areas mm -hmm. um, where there are communities who have historically lived alongside tigers and maybe haven't in, in recent history. And so looking at, at some of those challenges, like which conservation interventions could you put in place? For example, it, as the Armour Tiger's range, as you say, expands into China, um, uh, what is the response from local communities? How can you protect those individuals uh, from poaching? But how can you also prevent them coming into conflict with the communities that live there? Mm. Um, and there's obviously a lot of lessons you can learn from what's been achieved uh, on the Russian side of the border as well there. Mm -hmm. And with other tigers and other subspecies well, I guess, globally, other, right? other tigers across asia and indeed other big cats um yeah. so that's that's one of the really encouraging things that you can learn these lessons from from big cats all, and big cat conservation all around the world yeah so it's kind of it must be an exciting time then to kind of laying out these questions understanding the data the research that, you, that is currently known about species and trying to unpick and identify the problems that you're going to kind of focus on 
talking specifically about you know where the species is right now um what's your approach then for the next few years to try and sort of tackle what is quite a big question like you know where are a muir tiger you know what, what's their current distribution like are you going to go out in the field hunting for them individually so how is it camera traps is it i don't know what, what how are you going to do it well um i I can't actually reveal too much about okay. how we're going to fill in the gaps. Um, but I think you might be able to work that one out based on um, where the, the countries of, of mention are as to where the Armour Tiger is currently found and where we don't know where the Armour Tiger is found. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Over the next couple of years, we're hoping to obviously be able to present some of the findings of that work, mm -hmm. uh, which if anyone listening wants to find out more about, uh, they can find out on my page uh, on the ZSL website. Mm -hmm. Okay, I look forward to that. Intriguing, yeah. We'll have to circle back in a few years' time. <laughs> Good luck with that. So, how did you? How did you get? Um, what is quite an exciting, and I would think quite a high-profile PhD. It must have been, a, you know, to be studying, you know, a, a very charismatic, you know, top carnivore um, of huge conservation concern. Is it something that you created yourself and found funding for? Was it an advertised position that you applied for and secured? What was that process like? So I'm on uh, one of the DTPs, which uh, for those of your listeners who haven't come across them yet, the, the doctoral training programs, uh, right. a lot of them are funded by NERC, the Research Council. And essentially they allow you to do a little bit of training at the start of the program and then to begin to design your PhD once you've entered the program. Right. Uh, and, I, and I'm on the London program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm based at, um, as mentioned, both ZSL and UCL at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it was a it was a really difficult decision um, because I wanted uh, both to, to work with my my first love, which is large carnivores. I've been very lucky that um, throughout undergrad, both in the UK um, with uh, wolf and lynx populations in Europe and during my master's in the US with wolf populations out in Yellowstone, I've been able to work with large carnivores. Um, and so that was something that I, I really wanted to, to carry over into the Ph.D., but I was also keen to work with a species where there was a real conservation need. Mm -hmm. um, and that made it incredibly difficult to actually pick um, what to focus in on on my PhD. So in this particular case, I, I had the funding already in place thanks to that DTP structure. Yeah. Um, and it was a case of, of bringing together the collaborators who'd be able to make that project happen. So I've got a rather large supervisory team, uh, individuals based here in the UK, uh, in Norway, uh, in Russia uh, and in South Korea um, and it's it's a really quite large team bringing in all this different expertise um, which will hopefully um, make this project a reality. Yeah and that's probably uh, there's a good way of sort of laying the foundations for success I would think at the start of a research project is work with all the people who already have an interest in this and have a background in this because then you kind of in many ways you're sort of standing on the shoulders of giants you know you're not starting from scratch you're building from their knowledge forwards and they can support guide you in the right direction most quickly and it also builds your network too you know you're also immediately planting yourself within the right um yeah surrounds of people if you like no absolutely and um so, so much interesting science that's now being done particularly in conservation is is really at this intersection of these different disciplines mm -hmm. um and so all too often you, you have to uh, draw on collaborations and support um with experts in in different fields um mm -hmm. and it's an it's an amazing opportunity to get to learn from them as well yeah good well it's exciting we'll hear hear more about it where it goes in the future let's talk a little bit more about your background then so before your current um phd and, and the program that you kind of secured into what what have been your kind of main career stepping stones so far i mean you're still young but you seem to have done an awful lot. So give us a, a kind of potted history of the, you know, your career highlights, if you like, the things that stand out you think our listeners will be interested in. Well, I, I guess one of the things to start with that listeners who are maybe on the younger end of the scale might, might be interested by is that I didn't actually study biology at university. Right. I was, I was a geography student. Oh. Um, and it's an, a way into conservation that I didn't realise existed uh, almost before I signed up for it. Um, but I've always been interested in that intersection between um, the ecology and the science, mm -hmm. but also in its practical application, whether that's with communities or in environmental policy. And for me, geography was that kind of happy medium between the two. Um, I did end up in a, a, a more traditional course uh, once I got uh, a scholarship 
uh, to go to the US uh, mm -hmm. for my master's, the Toronto Award. Um, and the opportunity to, to study overseas and to work with researchers and conservationists in other countries was hugely important to me. And it's something that I really value and I think is really important. Um, hence why uh, I'm currently also based uh, at a South Korean university as well. Um, and it's really important to have those collaborations in order for the research and the work you do to have, have long lasting impacts. Mm. Um, when I came back to the UK, uh, I was very fortunate to get a, a Churchill Fellowship, um, which is a, a fellowship that allows you to um, study anywhere in the world. Uh, it's an independent research fellowship. Um, and you travel to those countries to learn about possibly practices that that country does particularly well. Uh, in my case, I was interested in island conservation because the UK is an, an island nation and we not only the British Isles themselves, but also the UK overseas territories, these 14 remote islands scattered all around the world with this quite incredible biodiversity, but that's really poorly known by the British public. And I wanted to go and learn what New Zealand in particular had pioneered in this area and how those techniques in island conservation have been introduced in Australia and in Fiji. Um, and the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust provides these Churchill fellowships to allow you to do so. Um, so I'd really encourage anyone who's interested in learning about a specific area of conservation that you think another area of the world does really well mm -hmm. at um, to investigate these fellowships. There's a specific environment category um, if you are interested. Oh, that's um, interesting. And it does seem like just listening to your story, like these, these fellowships and these opportunities have really opened up a lot of doors for you. And particularly this kind of Churchill um, fellowship sounds like it was a, a good opportunity to get out, travel, see things, meet other conservationists too, and understand the kind of the, the, the broader picture. What, what, how long did that fellowship last for? And what, what did you learn through that experience? So it's, uh, um, it actually varies between, between individual fellows. Mine yep. was a year in total um, okay. that I was working on the project. Um, and after that, I, I ended up uh, working in a policy advisor role for DEFRA back here in the UK, but have been involved in, and uh, projects ever ever since. Um, we've actually just got a film out um, about my Churchill Fellowship, and this is now four years uh, after I first started it. Right. Um, but some of the things we were looking at were, for example, the use of uh, invasive species eradications yep. um, as part of habitat restoration programs on islands. Um, and this is something that um, New Zealand really pioneered uh, and has a lot of the expertise in. And we're beginning to introduce in the UK overseas territories. So it was fantastic at the end of that year to get to visit um, the South Georgian government um, and the South Georgia Heritage Trust mm -hmm. down in the bottom of uh, kind of where the South Atlantic meets the Southern Ocean, because they were coming to the end of um, their rat and mice eradication program at that time. Mm -hmm. um, it was about to move into the monitoring phase. And it was really encouraging to see how these techniques um, were successfully being implemented. And of course, now uh, the movement is to try and um, use these same techniques to help protect um, a critically endangered endemic albatross on Gough Island, which is a, another part of the British Overseas Territories. Um, and if any of your listeners are, are interested to find out more, we've actually got a, a free um, conservation event with ZSL uh, coming up later this month. Um, it'll be broadcast on YouTube, so anyone can watch it. Um, but there'll be representatives who I met uh, during that work from the South Georgia Heritage Trust and the RSPB and a few other organizations there to to talk about these techniques and, and how they can be used. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And we'll link to that from below the video or below the podcast, wherever you're listening. That sounds great. Yeah. And something that's really close to my heart as well. We were just talking before the call as well that I, so I was involved in um, helping to helping to fund and develop a, a conservation program across the Pacific for BirdLife International around invasive um, species. And um, yeah, it's probably worth just kind of talking about, you know, the sorts of problems these, these critters kind of face and, 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 and cause and, and the issues that they, they kind of, particularly on island species, um, do tend to kind of to implement. So like what, so across the Pacific, you know, we're talking about a huge region, right? Which is like a little scattering of small islands where the seabirds, I mean, it's full of, a, a, a huge marine resource there full of fish and squid and everything else marine life which seabirds are going out to feed upon but the only place they can land and, and therefore breed are these small small tiny little islands really that's dotted across the ocean and on those islands as people have moved throughout history they've been taking species with them so we're talking about what rats pigs 
uh, mongoose, um, cats, all sorts of things that shouldn't be there. And once they get there, some establish and cause real problems for the species, particularly the seabirds that are found at those sites. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. It, it, it's something we really don't think about. Um, but it, it can have an, an absolutely devastating impact uh, on island biodiversity. Essentially, you're introducing these mammalian predators into environments where they haven't existed before. Um, and I think we were talking about one particular example from Samoa um, of the toothbill pigeon. Um, it's Samoa's national bird. It's one of the closest living relatives of the dodo, interestingly. Mm. Um, but is is currently really teetering on the brink of extinction. Um, and one of the reasons might be uh, the introduction of invasive species there. Um, there could be other factors involved, um, hunting, habitat loss. It seems to be quite specialist. Um, but you've got so many of these kind of amazing, weird and wonderful creatures that have ended up on islands for different reasons. And that could be they evolved there or that they're relic populations, all sorts of different reasons why they occur on islands. But they're then really heavily threatened by these invasive species once they manage to get there. Yeah. And I guess in some ways, the kind of the quite neat thing about conservation efforts specifically targeting invasive species is that the solution is quite obvious and, and sort of almost quite immediate too. You know, if on Gough Island you can remove the rats, which are eating the seabird chicks, the albatrosses and others, uh, and eggs as well, then problem solved. You know, they're almost overnight, literally almost overnight, these species can kind of come back and thrive. And, and also the habitats that support them can also start to reestablish too, that's been impacted by them too. It's, it's, um, it, it's, quite, an exciting, it's quite an exciting field to be in. It, it certainly is, but although it, it should be said that Goths are a particularly well, well studied system. Um, and actually we're quite fortunate uh, in Goth really that as you say, there's, there's one kind of key uh, identifiable threat um, that it's possible to deal with. And I, I guess this is maybe where the Pacific comes in that um, when you have different threats uh, intersecting, that's when the real challenges come. And particularly if you're dealing with inhabited islands. So um, the, one of the big advantages for Gough uh, is one of the main challenges for implementing invasive species removals is just that it's so remote. It's remote and it's uninhabited. But then when you take those same challenges to somewhere like Guam, where you've got a number of different invasive species, most famously the brown tree snake, mm -hmm. um, and there's been some interesting research out recently about brown tree snakes lassoing themselves essentially around the tree in order to to climb up it, um, which is, is really remarkable and, and certainly worth looking up. Um, but when you've got these kind of multiple threats going on and you're dealing on an inhabited island system, that means that some of these uh, invasive species removal techniques are much, much harder to implement uh, and potentially you've got other threats going on at the same time. That's where the real challenges lie. Um, and hence why the Pacific is such an interesting region for that. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, it's really interesting how the Kiwis, really, the New Zealanders of the world, really are spearheading and spreading, spreading their expertise out. You know, I heard it's a few years back now, but, you know, they're looking to kind of clear the, the two main islands. The ambition is to clear the two main islands of New Zealand, you know, um, invasive invasive free yeah 2050 target um no. it's it's certainly ambitious uh it but it, it's very much set the the compass point for new zealand um and those sorts of approaches as you say they've they were originally just used on offshore islands and they're now beginning to be used on peninsulas yeah. um and the question is can they be used for, for north and south island uh, yeah. in their entirety huge ambition yeah i mean if you spend any time in new zealand on the mainlands you realise actually you don't hear or see many birds, you know, and it's the predators. But if you go off to some of the offshore islands where they've been removed, it's like another, it is like stepping back into time. And one can only imagine what the two main islands would be like if they were truly predator free. So yeah, exciting times for this field. I find it, yeah, really interesting. Exciting times for you as well. So, I mean, you're a, you're a National Geographic explorer. You've already mentioned a, a bunch of places and yet just a small sprinkling of some of the places that you visited as a kind of conservation biologist during your career so far so far what does it mean to be a, a, a national geographic explorer um what does it allow you to do how did you get it so it um it, everyone might be surprised to know you can you can actually apply for it mm. um so it's an honorific associated with national geographics grants program 
Um, so National Geographic have quite an advanced grants program. Uh, you can find out more on the uh, NGS, which is National Geographic Society website. Yep. Um, and I got mine for setting up Range Without Borders. Um, mm -hmm. But there are all sorts of National Geographic explorers working all, on all sorts of interesting challenges um, for conservation and for the planet and storytelling all around the world. Um, and there's a community of us here in the UK um, and across Europe. Um, and it's really interesting to learn about the work that some of the others are doing. And what there's does it saying, enable you to do? What, what does the... What do you what do you receive as a result of becoming an expert? Well, as as well as uh, funding, um, and it's always nice. Yeah, which is is always very helpful, um, and the opportunity to obviously um, showcase your work uh, to National Geographic's audiences, which is uh, fantastic in terms of um, getting that. Um, in our case, we were looking to highlight the profile of wildlife ranges in an understudied area of the world, so that was perfect for us. Mm -hmm. But it's also an opportunity to learn from other explorers and to be inspired by some of the amazing work that they're doing. Um, and it also ends up leading potentially to other opportunities. Um, so for example, a, a number of the National Geographic explorers have also led expeditions for National Geographic in different capacities. Um, National Geographic, for example, run uh, tours also for paying members of the public. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very keen on having uh, National Geographic explorers lead those uh, when it relates to their specialist subject area. Right, but I yeah. think it's fair to say that the experience is, is very individual. Uh, it's very hard to say uh, what it will bring for, for an individual uh, National Geographic explorer. But it's it's certainly been uh, fantastic in my case. Hmm. It seems like, again, just listening to you, that you've spotted and made the most of a lot of opportunities that are out there for people like you with the fellowships and the explorers and other things, you know, you've proactively gone out there, found them, secured them and are making the most of them. And I wonder if a lot of people don't even realize that these things exist. Well, I, I think it was certainly the case for me that I didn't know a lot of these things existed. Almost. I felt I would kind of learn about them. And then uh, in, in the case of the national geographic explorer award, it was hugely important because we needed funding essentially to set up ranges that borders um we knew it was going to be an expensive project um and so we were having to look at a uh, grant funding that might potentially be able to to run that work um i wasn't uh, a student at the time um my co-pi was uh, he was based at oxford university's wildlife conservation research unit mm -hmm. um but we essentially had to independently fund that project mm -hmm. and i think that's a, a really important skill for conservation i mean you already mentioned Nick about um, fundraising for BirdLife International, mm -hmm. and and that being a, a hugely important part of the conservation picture. So getting that experience writing grants um, can be hugely useful later on. Yeah, it enables an awful lot. Yeah, I mean, when we look at um, just job descriptions that employers are looking for and the key skills that come out of that, that, that you know, it's right up there. You know, communications, which you're a great example of. Um, you know, project management, project development and fundraising. You know, if you've got these sort of skills in your back pocket, it makes you really employable and it makes you effective as well as a conservationist. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I think particularly because um, in terms of thinking about areas that conservation currently isn't working or conservation challenges that we're not really addressing, if you have a good idea and you, you want to try and address this, like whatever gap it might be that you're looking at, those are all those really important skills that are going to be needed in order to do something about that. Particularly if it comes to, say, starting up an organisation or mm -hmm. a campaign, leading expedition, whatever it might happen to be. Mm -hmm. um, but they're a hugely important part of, of that picture. Yeah. And so you've done this with Rangers Without Borders, starting an organisation up. Um, securing funding, raising profile. Um, I, I literally know nothing about it. So, you know, inform me and the listeners too, what, what was the idea and, you know, and what, and what did it become? So first and foremost, it's a conservation research program. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not setting out to, for example, train rangers. There are a lot of good organisations out there that already do that. Um, but we were, and this was myself and my co-PI, Peter Coles, aware that there was uh, there tended to be a uh, focus on the work of rangers in Africa and in the US national park system. And that outside of that, uh, and maybe a few other areas in the tropics, for example, India's national park system. Mm. And outside of that, 
the work of rangers was largely overlooked. Um, and we thought that that was an issue and that it was important to try and highlight the work of wildlife rangers in other areas of the world and to better understand their work because it's only by better understanding their work that you, you can essentially provide effective national or international support. And the reason why you want to do that is that often you'd get a, a case where a country has rangers that are employed by all sorts of different organizations. You've got government rangers, you've got NGO rangers, you might have WWF specific rangers, community rangers, mm -hmm. and they're all performing very different roles and responsibilities. They all have different levels of training they might some might be provided with a uniform others might be provided just with a pair of boots mm -hmm. uh, some with biological skills training some with four by four driving experience yeah. and it's it's very different uh, all around the world and we're aware that it's impossible to support the work of wildlife rangers if you go in with the assumption that all rangers for example are going to be operating in a militarized context that's often not the case and that the training they need our military skills again that's very often not the case mm -hmm. um, and in our case we decided to focus on Central Asia the Caucasus and Eastern Europe um, so far we've uh, conducted field work across six countries um, and we're interested in uh, potentially looking at other countries where we can apply uh, these same um, techniques and the aim essentially is to um, study the work of, of rangers uh, in the um, protected area system in each of these countries mm -hmm. and provide um, uh, notes and short recommendations which will enable organizations that want to support wildlife rangers in these areas that will allow them to to target that support because often they simply don't know that rangers here even exist right um, and we think that's a, a, a travesty um, that needs addressing because they're, they're hugely important for conservation in these these incredibly important parts of the world yeah so the assumption is that there's some great ranges that they do some great work but they're overlooked and the lessons of what they're doing well um should be captured and also shared with other ranger populations around yeah, the world no, absolutely and, and it might be that there are actually as you say important lessons in terms of uh op the way they're operating or, or their um, models of operation that could be useful for rangers in other locations mm -hmm. and a good example of that was um the, the uh, poacher turned gamekeeper model of, of rangering, uh, which can be very effective, uh, particularly in a community ranger context, um, has been very effectively used in, for example, Central Asia um, with former snow leopard poachers who are now uh, community rangers helping to protect snow leopards. Mm -hmm. um, and that model has been so successfully applied in some of those countries that there might be lessons there about how that could be applied with other species in other countries. And in that particular example, um, the the former poacher, which are now rangers, like what what's the financial model and incentive for them to kind of switch from one to the other? Are they who, who's paying their wage as a ranger, if you like? What what creates that livelihood? So uh, WWF plays a large part in that. It's yep. it's fair to say there are other uh, international NGOs that are involved in that, uh, and sometimes it's government based as well. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to say that. Uh, we tend to, and we are very guilty of doing this in conservation, we tend to portray individuals who are involved in poaching uh, as somehow evil or intending to set out to do that, which is all too often not the case. Mm -hmm. um, often these are individuals who, um, given a choice, would choose not to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but due to circumstance, um, that's meant that that's, potentially one of the few viable opportunities for them to support themselves or their families and their livelihoods. And that was the case for a lot of the former uh, Soviet states in Central Asia after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, during a period of uh, really intense chaos um, in that particular region of the world. Um, and certain individuals did turn to snow leopard poaching. Um, those individuals we found when interviewing them would have preferred not to have done so um, and are very happy now to be able to help protect those animals that play such an important cultural role in in some of those nations mm -hmm. um, but I think it's it's very important to say that often if you give individuals an opportunity uh, to protect wildlife um, they will do so um, and it's it's not necessarily a case of simply having uh, to pay individuals not to do so yeah yeah yeah, it's really interesting. I think 
you know, the skills of a poacher. I mean, I'm thinking here in the UK, we're both talking from the UK right now, and back in time, egg collecting was an issue here for the kind of songbirds. Um, and there is there is almost no greater skill in the in, in natural history in the UK from those that could go out and find nests and find those eggs. You know, I challenge anyone to go and d- don't do it. <laughs> but you know, the the level of skill, the natural history skill that these guys have is, is unbelievable. You know, and they became conservationists in good time. You know, I'm sure if we dug into David Attenborough, he collected eggs as a kid. <laughs> you know, and it's it's that sort of closeness and understanding of the natural world, which a poacher, you know, also has of the, of the particular species they're trying to find, you know, is almost so close to a love and a need to conserve as well. The sort of, you know, you can see very easily you can kind of transition from one to the other. And that's that's the opportunity, isn't it, that you're kind of exploring and, and highlighting. Yeah. Where do, where do you hope the programme will go? Rangers Without Borders, where, where do you, you know, uh, five, 10 years from now, what would, what would yeah. amazing success look like for you guys? Um, well, I, I think we're about to move into uh, stage two of the programme. And uh, what I'm personally hoping from that is, as, as well as launching a, another round of countries to work in, is actually to bring together uh, a database of um, uh, skills gaps and mm-hmm. uh, skills provision. Mm. Because what we're able to do at the moment is to provide uh, specific recommendations, but we're not able to uh, match, say, um, an individual protected area where particular skills are needed with an organization who are looking to provide those skills. Mm. And wouldn't that be good if there was a system where essentially through through a, a simple database model where you're able to match up skills needed and, and as I say, skills provision. Um, and that's something that I would personally really like to work on. Yeah, and, can, um, and, and I think like a buddying system as well. Absolutely, remotely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's that's really interesting. Um, a lot of people listening might be just a few years behind you. They might be still at university, doing a you know a bachelor's degree or maybe in a master's something like that, and and they'd love to kind of follow in your footsteps. What sort of advice would you give you know people like that who are listening right now who'd like to move on to do a PhD, would like to secure you know scholarships and, and other fellowships things like that what 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 would you like to share with them i think the first thing i'd say is uh, be ambitious mm-hmm. um mm. be creative and be imaginative um we are all aware of the challenges that the natural world faces and it will require an awful lot of creativity on the parts of all of us in order um to meet any of those challenges and so if there are particular challenges that you think are important, go out uh, and try and do something about it, whether that's setting up an organization, as I say, leading an expedition, doing research, um, uh, maybe doing a film or, or some form of uh, science communication that's able to reach wider audiences. Mm-hmm. Um, there are organizations out there that are prepared to support you in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, the Royal Geographical Society is a great place to start mm-hmm. if you're on the uh, research um, side of things and particularly for expedition planning mm-hmm. um, and the Geography Outdoors Department uh, is a great place to start as is um, the Explore Weekend which is every November mm-hmm. um, and helps with field work planning, grant writing, um, ideas and inspiration. Mm-hmm. Once you've uh, got an organisational programme going, uh, the Queen's Commonwealth Trust uh, is a really good organisation to look at. But if you're working uh, in the Commonwealth or you are a Commonwealth citizen, mm-hmm. um, and that provides uh, support and training resources um, for maybe taking uh, your organisation or your idea to the next level, um, mm-hmm. how, you, how you can then uh, look to grow that programme, how can you look to grow its impact? Mm-hmm. Um, and that would be an, another really good place to look. Yeah. Um, if you're... Uh, listening from America, um, the Explorers Club is probably a good alternative. Uh, the Royal Geographical Society is based in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, the Explorers Club is, although it has chapters all around the world, it's based in New York. Um, so that might be a good uh, alternative organisation to look at. Um, yeah. And they actually offer a, a Young Explorers Programme, um, which when things improve uh, around the world, I'm, I'm sure they might be offering again. Um, and that can be a good place um, to get uh, experience and to meet some really interesting individuals. Um, I think I would also say um, consider opportunities overseas. 
um, depending on what your particular interests are, uh, de depending on uh, what you want to um, do for a PhD or, or what you want to work in later on. Um, it's been a hugely important experience for me, um, being able to study overseas and to learn from other experts in other countries. Um, and it's a way to make sure that your work is a lot more collaborative, it's a lot more impactful, um, and it looks great on an application for a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say that's, that's really important. And finally, I'd add if, um, if you're interested potentially in uh, approaches of applied conservation, um, remember that there are lots of different options to do so. Um, for me, one of those areas of interest was uh, in applied uh, policy. Um, so with DEFRA, but there are, uh, again, a number of organizations out there, whether that's um, the individual agencies, people like Natural England mm -hmm. um, and uh, their respective equivalents in the devolved bodies. Um, the UK Overseas Territories governments are often looking uh, for conservationists to work in, um, in their respective departments. Yep. Um, UNEP um, and the World Conservation Monitoring Centre in Cambridge is, is another good place to look. Yep. Um, and so remember these opportunities out there. And, and obviously that's one of the great things about conservation careers, um, helping to highlight those opportunities to, to young conservationists. Thank you. And the brown envelope will be in the post for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's great advice in there. And I think what really stood out for me is one of the first words you said, actually, is, which is be ambitious. You know, I think when I, th when I listen to you and I sort of look at your career so far, you've had that ambition. You've sort of been slightly fearless in what you've done. And I really, I've, I really, um, I really value that I think that's just fantastic you know and I think more people should be like that because it shows what you can achieve when you when you do have that approach to to your career and your life yeah um we usually end the podcast with just with a few more open questions just to kind of hear what's important to you and how you think and and one I'd like to ask you is just, um what would you like to, to see change in conservation or what do you think conservationists should be better at you know, we're still seeing species, habitat, sites, you know, deteriorating across the planet. We're probably, we are losing the battle still. Um, what, what, what should we, what do you think conservationists just need to be better at? What do we need to kind of turn the volume up to 10 on or even 11? I think uh, for conservation, I would like to see young people given more opportunities in conservation. Mm -hmm. um, I think all too often uh, young conservationists have a lot of fantastic ideas and aren't always given the opportunities to put those into practice. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was really important to me with Range Without Borders. Uh, our entire team was under 30. Um, a lot of our team were under the age of 25 when we started. Um, and it's important to me that young people are given the opportunity to show that they can make a difference for some of these huge conservation challenges all around the world. And there would be occasions where I would be in meetings and it would be mentioned that, I was young enough to be um, the person on the other side of the table's grandchild. Um, but it is incredibly important that young people do step up and are given the opportunity to make a real difference for the natural world. In terms of things we might be good at, um, hmm. I would like to see more conservationists get involved in policy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an intimidating world, which we tend to shy away from, particularly um, those of us who are on the uh, science end of conservation. But it's an incredibly important way to make a difference for the natural world. Mm -hmm. It's um, We can advise policy as much as we like, but if that doesn't actually come about, then there won't be any changes that happen. Uh, and so I'd like to see more people who are interested in conservation get involved in environmental and conservation policy. Mm. And if I could make you the global policy advisor for the environment um, for a day tomorrow, um, what single policy would you like to implement that the world would need to follow that might make a big difference for this little planet we're kind of spinning around on? Well, I think that one depends on what you think is the biggest threat. Uh, for me personally, habitat loss is the biggest threat worldwide and, yeah. and particularly um, tropical forest loss. Um, even though I, I work with large carnivores in cold environments, uh, I still believe that that's the single uh, biggest threat that the world faces. Um, global climate change, though, undoubtedly will become a bigger issue mm -hmm. uh, as we move through in, throughout the 21st century. Um, and so I think if you were to ask me that question now and to maybe ask me that question in five years time, that might have changed mm -hmm. potentially. Um, but I think 
habitat loss and particularly tropical forests is a huge part of huge part of the question um, and bringing countries around the world because it is a global challenge together to find solutions for that because the burden is un, undoubtedly on a few countries that hold most of these resources mm -hmm. and finding a sustainable solution long term for the planet and socially and politically I think is is, is absolutely the most important thing right now. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Josh, thank you so much for kind of jumping on the podcast, sharing your time with us and your expertise. Um, it's been really nice to kind of start to get to know you. I hope we stay connected. I'll be really interested to hear where you go, what happens next, particularly in your research. If people want to find out a little bit more about you and what's going on um, with your research or other things you're involved with, where should we direct them? Um, so people can head to my profile on the ZSL website uh, or on the National Geographic website. Um, and they can find out lots more information about uh, what I'm up to there. Um, but also uh, keep an eye out on um, WWF uh, International's channels um, for uh, upcoming campaigns with WWF Voices, um, where we'll be talking about conservation issues in, in different parts of the world. Well, well, absolutely. It sounds like you're everywhere. I guess if we put your name to Google, we'll just follow the first, you know, 20 links. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again, Josh. Great to meet you. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's been a, been a pleasure. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, and also please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation hyphen careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.